This tutorial continues after the last one by discussing the different speeds with which different modes of a wave of a slab waveguide propagate down the length of a waveguide channel. This is important because if you send a pulse into a waveguide, it's going to broaden as different components of it travel at different speeds. Let's start with the definition of phase velocity, which I'm going to call V sub pH. The phase velocity of a monochromatic beam, we've already studied that. That's always given by omega over k. And for consistency with what's going to come below, I'm going to rewrite that just as the inverse, k over, over omega to the minus 1 power. And that, we have defined the refractive index that way. So that's called C0 over n for a monochromatic beam at, at frequency omega. n is then a, a function of frequency. When we send a pulse into an optical fiber, we are talking about something like this. We've got an electric field as a function of time. And we are generally, if we're sending a pulse, by definition, we're not sending a simple sinusoid. We're going to be sending some sort of signal whose envelope looks like that in time, and then maybe at some later time recurs. So a pulse sequence like this. And as you know from Optics 261, this is not a pure sinusoidal wave. It's got some much sharper dependence, and it's composed of a lot of different oscillation frequencies. It's a Fourier decomposition of a whole bunch of frequencies. We don't need to do the math of that now. We just need to appreciate that this is not monochromatic light. If this is the intensity of light as a function of time, it must be that it's composed of a range of colors of light with different omega values. And so what's important here is to consider what is the velocity with which a pulse, if you send a pulse of light into a waveguide, what, with what speed is that packet going to travel down the waveguide, and how is it going to spread in time? If it starts off as a very narrow pulse, what kind of delta T spread will it pick up? But let me introduce some concepts. This pulse here is what we will call formally, and what's called in the literature formally, a group. And that group is going to have some sort of velocity also. We can think of it, not that the exact choice of units matter here, but something like millimeters per second. There's a velocity associated with that group as it moves along. And there's a formula for what the group velocity is. And here's why I have to, for the one time in this tutorial, say it turns out that the group velocity is not the inverse of k over omega, but it's the inverse of the derivative of k with respect to omega. This is something you can look up elsewhere. I believe it's in the BYU book. If you just follow the math through of that, though, we're not going to derive it here because that's not the point of this particular tutorial. You get, instead of just C0 over n, and what we pick up is a little bit of extra n related to how n varies with frequency. And this has a definition. This denominator defines what we call the group index, capital N sub g. Just letting you know that this, this term here is referred to in that way. Before we go any further, let's look at a simulation to compare group velocity to phase velocity. You can see here an example of a case where the group velocity is equal to 1. And what that means here is that the phase and group velocities are equal. The group velocity is the velocity with which the pulse maximum moves to the right. And because it's equal to 1, it's actually equal to the phase velocity. And the reason you can see that is that this interference pattern between two slightly different wavelength beams of light, what, the reason why the group velocity is 1, same as the phase velocity, is maxima of the envelope drift along at exactly the same rate that the phase maxima of the individual oscillations drift along. So this would be a case, if we look at our expression up here, this would be a case where 
the group velocity, the group refractive index seems to equal the waves, the wave refractive index, or the group velocity equals the phase velocity. That would imply, if we just look at our math, that dn d omega is zero. Well, what does that mean? dn d omega being zero means that the refractive index doesn't change with frequency. And we know from our Lorentz model that that's not the true model of how refractive index varies. Generally, in regions of normal dispersion, let's, let's see this. In regions of normal dispersion, we have a dependence that looks like this. Right, if we graph refractive index n versus frequency omega, the typical thing that's happening is that the refractive index is increasing with frequency. Sometimes we might encounter a region of anomalous dispersion, but then we start recovering again. And in most regions, like this here, which is the way things look in the optical regime from red to blue, we have dn d omega being greater than zero. So that implies that the group index is usually a little bit larger than the refractive index. That would slow down this wave. It would make C0 over NG a smaller quantity. So if I make the group velocity a little smaller, if I type in, I'll make it pretty extreme, 0 0.5. Now you'll notice that the wave has tr changed differently. Do you now see that within the packets, do you see that the phase fronts are now advancing and moving through the packet. I'm tracing that with the cursor here. It's faster than the advance of the packet. An individual peak comes and moves through, becomes the maximum of its local packet, and then moves down and becomes small again. So it's outrunning the peak of the packet. By the same token, if I, region, if I enter a region of anomalous dispersion, then the group velocity will get larger than the phase velocity. And that looks like this. It's a little harder to see it, but can you see that the peaks are now moving backwards within each packet? You can see at the minima, you can see that peaks are being born and they actually move backwards. Not backwards with respect to the overall drift, but backwards with respect to the peaks of the envelope. The peaks are moving backwards. The phase velocity is less than the group velocity. So if we want to be rigorous about the way a pulse moves down a waveguide, and that's what we want to think about, is how different pulses in different modes of a waveguide advance, what their speeds are, and what their difference in speeds are, we do have to keep in mind that we're considering, we're trying to compare group velocities. So let's get to the next term after group velocity, which is a speed. If we invert that, we get a group delay. And the group delay has a somewhat unfamiliar uh, set of units. It's time divided by length. And the way you can think of that is to say, how many seconds does it take a pulse to travel a certain length of waveguide? So I'm going to give that quantity a tau variable, tau group. And it's literally the inverse of the group velocity by definition. So even though this tau looks like a t for time, it's a tau and it's seconds per millimeter. It's not a unit simply of time. So the math here is just to invert this. There's the inversion. I'm going to break this up into the first term, the lowercase n over c naught, plus a second term, omega over c naught, times the derivative, dn d omega. So what group delay tells us is the time it will take a pulse of a certain mode to travel a certain distance within a fiber. And different modes may travel at different speeds. We specifically consider the wave vectors A and B from the previous tutorial, and we can think about how they would travel at different speeds. And that would be what we would call group delay that would be characterized by group delay dispersion, or as titling at the top there, mode velocity dispersion, how different modes travel at different speeds. That's still going to be characterized by seconds per millimeter. 
This is going to tell us how pulses that populate two different modes of a waveguide will spread out versus distance. If they travel a certain distance in the fiber, how many seconds will they be separated by? We would now be talking about delta t, a difference in group delay for a pulse in mode 1 and a pulse in mode 2. And we'll think about that as being the tau value for mode A minus the tau value for mode B. And if we look at this expression over here, that would be equal to Na minus Nb divided by the speed of light. Plus, now we're assuming these pulses come from the same narrowband laser source. So there isn't a large spread in omega. It's okay for us to think about some mean frequency omega for both pulses that are spectrally fairly narrow. But, but we can think about dNa d omega, the refractive index experienced by one mode, minus dNb d omega, the refractive index felt by the other mode. Now if we go up to this curve and imagine that this is the refractive index of the core of the waveguide, what we'd call N1, and we think about the refractive index of the cladding, the cladding has got to have a slightly lower refractive index, but it's usually made out of a very similar material, and they have very similar refractive indices. But more importantly, their slopes are almost identical. So we're going to make the approximation that the difference in the, in the slope of the refractive indices of the core and the cladding versus frequency is approximately zero. And that makes this term small compared to this term. So if this term goes away, then what we've got is that the difference is approximately just Na minus Nb over C0. And therefore, the time difference for pulses in different modes traveling a distance L. So we're going to send a pulses into the same optical fiber, one exciting mode A, one excited mode B, where A and B refer to the characteristic angles of propagation for the, the rays, we would have to conclude that we would have to conclude that that is equal to the group delay dispersion seconds per millimeter times the length of the pulse traveling and we just look at this simple expression here, that's equal to L over C naught which is a unit of, which is an amount of time, the amount of time it would take at the speed of light to travel a distance L, times the difference in the refractive index felt by the two modes. We already said in the previous tutorial that the M equals zero mode, the lowest order mode of a waveguide, the refractive index for that mode is approximately that of the core material, N1, and for the highest M, if it's a highly multi-mode waveguide, the highest M, the refractive index is approximately N2, the refractive index of the cladding, and therefore we would find that this delta N can be estimated for a waveguide as being N core minus n cladding. So this is our way of making an estimate, as you need to do on the homework. This is the way to make an estimate of how much a pulse exciting a multimode fiber, a short pulse, will spread out in time when it reaches the other end of the fiber. That fiber has a length L, and there are many modes excited all at once. They won't all travel at the same speed. And the difference in refractive indices between the core and the cladding gives an approximate estimate. It's a little bit overly generous. It won't be quite this much of a spread. But the, this formula here tells you about what the temporal spread will be in the outgoing pulse, which places a limit on the rate at which you can send modulated pulses down an optical fiber and expect them to be non-overlapping at the other end.